Throughout the year, OSA will be hosting speakers each month to present archaeological research conducted throughout the state and around the region. All lectures are free and open to the public, and this year we will continue to live stream these events, and after which they'll be posted uh, in perpetuity to uh, the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources uh, YouTube channel. Today it's my honor to introduce the first speaker of 2019, uh, Mr. John J. Mintz. John is a native of Brunswick County, North Carolina, and received his Bachelor of Science degree from Appalachian State University. He went on to earn his Master's of Arts in Anthropology in 1989 from the University of Arkansas. He joined OSA in 1998, serving as site registrar, then as assistant state archaeologist and deputy state archaeologist, uh, before finally becoming state archaeologist in 2017. John brings more than 30 years of experience investigating historic, prehistoric, and maritime archaeological sites throughout the Southeast and the Middle Atlantic regions. His research interests include economic anthropology um, and ethnohistory. He has a strong, enthusiastic, and abiding commitment to supporting and fostering partnerships and collaborations that promote public archaeology and education. Today, John will present the state of North Carolina archaeology, the past, present, and future of archaeology in North Carolina. Please welcome John Mintz. Thank you, Thank you. I appreciate everybody coming today. I'll be respectful of your time. And before I get started, my name may appear on the lower left-hand corner of this slide, but this was a project done by all, everyone in Office of State Archaeology. Everyone contributed to it. We have a wide range of talent. It ranges from maritime to terrestrial geophysics in the maritime setting to geophysics in a terrestrial setting, bioarchaeology, paleoethnobotany, soils, ceramic uh, analysis, lithic reproduction. So we have a long and varied history and a long and deep well of knowledge in the Office of State Archaeology. We also work very closely with the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. We work one-on-one -on -one with them on a lot of work, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes with the Environmental Review. And as David mentioned, we have a lot of partnerships. We have some formal partnerships and some informal partnerships, and I'd just like to acknowledge those just a little bit before we start, because again, nothing that we can do, we do alone. We do it with everyone else. Everybody pitches in. So we work very closely with the Department of Transportation, the Corps of Engineers, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service. Uh, we work with state historic sites. I don't think I'm, I may be missing a couple but we work very closely with them and we actually do sometimes we do uh what would we call it uh, labor sharing they'll help us on some projects and we'll help them on some projects and what this does is it allows us to cross pollinate we'll take our expertise and we'll share it with them and they'll take their expertise and share it with us we can cross pollinate and we can move forward historic preservation and north carolina archaeology in north carolina so the first slide here is we are part of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, so we are part of a very large family. And quite a few of these slides will be self-explanatory, and I'll give some asides or some extra information as we move forward with it. But again, we work very closely with a lot of these organizations. Uh, we are the Office of State Archaeology. We were created by the North Carolina General Assembly in 1973 to coordinate and implement a statewide archaeological preservation program as part, as I mentioned earlier, of the State Historic Preservation Office. Generally speaking, prior to 1973, the universities located in North Carolina basically ran their own show. They assigned their own archaeological site number, which is just a number that designates an archaeological site so we can know what county it is, what number of site it was recorded in that. So it's an identifying number, if you will. Some of our programs, including maintaining a statewide computer-based inventory of archaeological sites, enforcing the North Carolina Archaeological Resource Protection Act, uh, General Statute 70, Articles 2, 3, and 4, and implementing the policies of the National Historic Preservation Act and North Carolina General Statutes 12112A. And this was our 2018 Archaeology Day we hosted on the, uh, the mall, Federal Street Mall, and shown here are only the OSA Raleigh staff. That's because that's who were in Raleigh. But we came up with the squirrel there, uh, and that's the staff taking part that day, and it was a little bit rain and cold. But again, when you see something that's OSA Raleigh specific, that does not exclude the other four locations. We have four locations, which we'll get to in a minute, and we interact on a daily basis on our projects and on our programming. 
As I said, we have five locations. We have Asheville, we have Raleigh, we have the underwater archaeology branch at Curry Beach, we have the Greenville Queen Anne Shipwreck Project in Greenville, which is on the west campus of East Carolina University. The Raleigh office, the Asheville office, and the Curry Beach office discharge our environmental review duties as noted under Section 106 and or 110 of the State Histor uh, National Historic Preservation Act. Uh, the Greenville office deals mainly with the Queen Anne Shipwreck Project and then also in Raleigh there to the top left, or actually to the top right as you're looking at it, is our research center and we house over 11 million objects there. And that was formally dedicated in about 1998. Prior to then, we housed our objects, our collections, in the basement of an older home down on Blunt Street. Our mission, and like I said, a lot of these are self-explanatory. I won't try to, to read them all out to you, but we strive to protect the state's maritime and terrestrial archaeological legacy through the application of state and federal laws and regulations by maintaining inventories of, and data uh, of site data of artifact collections. Again, maritime and terrestrial. Our maritime responsibilities on the ocean extend from the low tide mark out to about one marine league, which is roughly three nautical miles. And I want to say we've got over 4,000 shipwrecks or submerged archaeological sites recorded there. And let me back up just a little bit. When you saw that the QAR project is in Greenville and it's primarily conservation of the Queen Anne shipwreck projects, we were very lucky to have three scientific divers and one dive master work in that office. So they support our Curry Beach diving operations. Like I said earlier, we, we each support one another in, in, in multiple, uh, multiple venues. And here is just a table from the Public Archaeology Day on October the 2018. And again, we'll go through a couple of slides here. So you can see what we do and kind of give you the general overview of what we do. And I'll try to talk about these a little bit as we go along. And I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. And if I don't know the answer, the staff does and, and we can go from there. And as David said in my intro, I, I am a very, very passionate proponent of public education and outreach. Because if we don't take the opportunity that we have and the resources that we possess here at the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources to educate the public and, and, and reach out to them and share what we do. We are missing, in my opinion, 99% of what we should be doing as we move forward. Everything else will fall into place. It's if you explain something to someone, even though they didn't understand what it was, they may not fully agree with it, but they will at least have had the opportunity to have it explained to them and they can come to their own conclusions, reach their own decisions. But again, the education is paramount in what we do. And, and even in when you come to the law and the regulations or the environmental review, the historical and cultural preservations, once people know what needs to be done, why it needs to be done, how it needs to be done, they can then become part of the process. And there is a part for everyone to play. Okay. And again, you're going to see some, some laws up there and some general statutes. And basically, the NEPA basically says that the federal government needs to take into consideration uh, impacts or, or uh, projects, undertakings on, on federal property. That's a, I want to say I think that was a 1970, 1970 law, uh, Section 106, 1966, Section 4F is a Transportation Act, then you get down to the state. So we discharge federal law and state law and or general statutes. So our state law is the state environmental policy which began about, oh, I want to say in 1971. Uh, we have our general statute 12112A, general statute 70, article 2.3, and article 4 is not up there. But, but two, you know, these deal with uh, ARPA permits, archaeological research protection permits, uh, unmarked burials, uh, also deals with our archaeological site file database that we maintain an archaeological site file database. And Executive Order 16 basically says that a state agency needs to determine the National Register of Historic Places eligibility of any property that may be under, uh, affected by a state undertaking. And there's, there's variations to that, and we'll discuss these a little bit further as we go along. And like I said, I wanted to get through the laws and the regulations 
our environmental review mandate and duties and then move more into some of the more fun stuff that we do. Not to say that this can't be fun at times, but it's not nearly as good as freezing outside or, or suffering through 110 degree weather. And again, this is how it works. And you'll see the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office at the very top, Office of State Archaeology, federal agencies, could be the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Corps of Engineers, FHA, Federal Environmental Regulatory Commission, state and local governments, applicants for federal and our state grants, funding licenses or permits, federally recognized tribes and TIPOs, which I'll talk about in a moment, non-federally recognized tribes and organizations uh, in North Carolina, and then the public. So basically these are what we would call the players in the environmental review, and then the archaeological consultants. So each one of those lines, depending upon the project, may or may not interact all the time. Some may, excuse me, some may interact part of the time, but generally it's a, it's a large circle with a big pie chart in it, and each one needs to let the other one know what they're doing, why they're doing, and how they're doing it. Okay, so you've heard about the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Okay, so the State Historic Preservation Office, there's, there's one in every state, and Dr. Kevin Cherry is our SHPO, and they're in U.S. territories, and there's also a tribal historic preservation officer for each federally recognized tribe. And we deal most commonly, if you will, with the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, uh, and their tribal historic preservation officer is Russ Townsend. We also deal with the Catawba tribe, although they are not physically at present located in North Carolina. They are in Rock Hill, South Carolina, just across the border up by uh, Charlotte and we work with Dr. Wyona Hare on interest or projects that are of interest to the Catawba. And then you got the uh, Council on Historic Preservation and they help implement section 106 and 110. So a little bit about 106 and 110, it's a process that begins with an undertaking and it's almost a, basically a checklist and we go down and it's one of these statements like, if then that. So we all have to be well versed in, in federal law and state law and state statutes. This is a very important section of the National Historic Preservation Act. And basically, Section 304 says that the actual location of an archaeological site can be withheld or not shared with the public if doing so may risk that site. For instance, a lot of the sites, I would say probably eight tenths or more, are located on private property. Now, a caveat to that would be large landholding agencies like the U.S. Forest Service, sometimes state parks, which is a state organization, not a federal organization, and military uh, bases like Fort Bragg. And I want to say at last count, Fort Bragg probably had 4,500 plus archaeological sites recorded on there, which may lead one to say, well, why does Fort Bragg have so many archaeological sites? It's because by federal law, they had to discharge their duties in relation to section 106 and 110. So that reflects an intensive archeological investigation or survey of those areas. And you can say, okay, well, that's good. You know, they had to do that, they did it. What does that tell you? So when you can take a defined area in a topographic situation intersected by various drainages and develop a large number of archeological site file data, then one can begin to put that together and make some preliminary draft statements about when was it occupied? Who occupied it? Or what did they eat? Did they move around a lot? So basically, you can take information and extrapolate outwards and begin to recreate what was going on in that particular area. Then oftentimes, you can extrapolate that to other areas that may or may not have the same, let's just call them geophysical, or, or not geophysical, but uh, topographical situations or hydrological situations. Um, and then, again, who can look at this archaeological site file data? Generally speaking, it's consultants or people that are certified or have the uh, Secretary of Interior's qualifications. That's just to make sure because a lot of, like I said, a lot of this information is one of a kind. It's non-renewable. It's not like renewable. You can't plant another archaeological site. So you need to record that site. You need to manage it. To manage it. And then occasionally you need to do what we would call data recovery excavation is to mitigate the adverse impact that may be foisted upon that site by any manner of undertaking. So again, you know, you have to have professional standards. What does that do? That lets us know who we're dealing with, that they have the qualifications to do what they need to do, and that they can do it in the proper way 
not only through the method and theory of the archaeological investigations, but also to make sure that the statutory requirements are met. And that is a shot of Sam Franklin, our GIS analyst, in our map room there. And we used to have on his left-hand side down by his knees, those are map cabinets that have a US, Ge U.S. Geological Survey quadrangles. And once upon a time, all of our site locations are on those. But thankfully now we have a geographic information system which works and it uh, allows us to manage what we have in a much faster and more efficient manner. Uh, so we talked a little about the National Historic Preservation Act. So that ties into the National Register of Historic Places. And again, this slide is, is basically self-explanatory. But there are four criteria, A, B, C, and D. D, having have yielded or may be likely to yield information important in prehistory or history. That's generally the criteria that is used when we evaluate the significance for listing in the National Register of Historic Places that particular site. Now, having said that, does that preclude that particular site having criteria from A, B, and C? No. We have a couple of sites in North Carolina, and one of them is uh, Fort Neoroca. It is eligible or has been listed, if I'm not mistaken, under A, B, C, and D. How does this work? If Section 106 or 110 generally, sometimes 120, 112A maybe, archaeological surveys undertaking, a certain number of sites are found, the eligibility requirements for listing in the National Register are applied to those sites in the field. Once the field archaeologist, the archaeological consultant does that, the report comes to our office through the SHPO. We review that and apply these criteria to it. Once we apply these criteria to it and we determine that, yes, indeed, this site is eligible for listing in the National Register places under whatever criteria, normally D, but again, remember, it could be A, B, C, and D, then we will have to work out a mitigation plan. Can this site be avoided? Because when you look at it, and let's just use D as our example, that is a site, and I don't want to use the term one of a kind, but it has the capacity, the data, to, to greatly influence, change, or add to how we understand either the prehistoric period or the historic period. So it's basically extremely important to our understanding of who went before us. And in a, in a lesser term, it can be said that all sites have the ability to inform us, <coughs> inform, of, inform us of that, but we follow the NHP, National Register of Historic Places, under criteria D, so then we have to work out a mitigation. Can we avoid it, or do we need to do large-scale data recovery excavation to gather the knowledge, gather the data, gather the site information from that, and then be able to reproduce that in written form so generations after can look at it? And even more so now, more and more on some of the excavations, and most certainly on some of the test units, 3D modeling is coming into play, which greatly aids that. So once we go down the path, if you will, to data recovery, right, for a site that's been determined to be eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, we remove those artifacts, the history of the people that put them there, the history of the artifacts, the private provenance and the provenience. We remove that from that particular area. What we have to do is remove that in such a fashion that it can be replicated and understood on paper, and like I said, even moving more forward into 3D modeling and other areas. And here are some of the, uh, so the Archaeological Resource Protection Act of 1979, that's a federal. So then we come along to the Archaeological Resource Protection Act, General Statute 70, Article 2. That basically says for the state of North Carolina that any land owned, controlled, owned, controlled, or uh, owned, controlled, or managed, if you will, by the state of North Carolina, a permit has to be issued through our office for any archaeological work to be done on that. And, and basically that just ensures, again, that the person applying to do the work has a reason to do it and they meet the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines. So what we're looking for here is quality control and quality assurance. It's like when you could do your math. You might could do the math in your head, but you have to be able to show your work. Some of the other statutes that we have are the Native American Graves and Protection and Repatriation Act the Unmarked Human Burial and Human Skeletal Remains Protection Act, 
and other laws. GS 65 deals with cemeteries. Uh, GS 14, 149 basically says you cannot go out there and desecrate a, a grave, a single grave, multiple graves, or a cemetery. Okay, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. We have the Office of State Archaeology, Archaeological Research Center down on Lane Street. The photograph on the left is our second floor, and you can see our boxes of collections running down. And then on the right side, you can see our first floor where actual analysis takes place. We employ a lot of uh, volunteers, students, graduate students, and interns. Quite often, a lot of our research collections are used by students to further their education. It could be at the undergraduate level, the master's level, it could be at the PhD level. Off here to the right-hand side, talked a little bit earlier about the Queen Anne Shipwreck Conservation Project, and we're lucky to have three other, four of their, three of their conservators in here, uh, two of the other staff members. But basically, if I'm not mistaken, somebody tell me if I'm wrong, that's a cannon that's being worked on. And, you know, again, I said at the very beginning how we all work together. Well, that's a great example of everybody elbow to elbow working on the same project. And then off to the right, we have our own Kim Kenyon working on a project there at the, the Queen Anne Shipwreck Project in Greenville. Maritime Archaeology, I talked about that a little bit. The main hub of the Maritime Archaeology is at Curry Beach. So on the left-hand side, you have divers suiting up, getting ready to, to dive off Beaufort Inlet to investigate the Queen Anne Shipwreck Project. So they're getting ready to go into water. The top center is what's left of the Currituck. Uh, it was a coal ship that ran aground. And oftentimes when these ships run aground, they'll break apart. Some of it washes up on shore, so we may record it. And let's just use this for an example. At the end of 13th Street at Curry Beach, and a year from now, it could be at the 21st Street because storms move that debris along. So here, efforts are being made to recover that and take it back in. To the bottom there, you can see them. Uh, so we go from the ocean to the creeks or the uh, lakes, and that's Lake Phelps. There are a large number of dugout canoes in Lake Phelps, and what they were doing sometime back, they had a big, huge peat fire up at Lake Phelps near Somerset, they, and the, they were drawing down water out of there to help uh, extinguish that fire. So staff went out there and took the old coordinates from a uh, total station, worked them up, and I can see in the center there you can see a GPS, a global positioning system, and they were remapping them and checking on the, the status of them because there's so many of these dugouts and they're so expensive to curate, why not at a state-owned facility where they can reach what I would just call equilibrium, record them where they are, maintain some sort of condition reporting, and leave them there. And then uh, to the right, we have a, a dredge, something like a large vacuum cleaner, taking up uh, soil sediment from the floor around the Queen Anne shipwreck. And then on the right, we're bringing up a cannon. And again, you can see, I want to say there's four divers in there, again, working very closely together. All of these processes, all of these tasks, all of these undertakings that we do by our definition can be very time consuming and they can be very uh, in depth. As you can see on the, the left, they're just suiting up to go, and then on the right, you can actually see them in the water, and you can see them in the water down here. So what we do is very wide and varied. Like I said, we work on terrestrial and maritime. And here's some of the fun stuff that we like to do. So this is basically, you know, self-explanatory again, our public education and outreach. We take it very serious. We have workshops. We have symposiums and lectures, of which this is kicking off 2019. Staff throughout the state at all five locations present uh, papers at professional organizations. We do several type of publications. We work very closely with the North Carolina Archaeological Society, which is comprised of amateur or avocational archaeologists. We work very closely. In fact, some of the staff serve on those boards uh, with the North Carolina Archaeological Council, which are made up of professionals. We work, again, very close with some government agencies, which you'll see some photographs in a minute. And then school groups. We do Facebook Live and we do Skype. Uh, on some of our public education, we actually bring the school groups out. And over here on the right was uh, one of our most recent was at the Lumber River Public Archaeology Day in 2018. And that's one of the tables that we had set up there. And we'll move through a few slides here and it'll become obvious of what we're doing. But what we try to do when we go in the field is to prepare ahead of time, not only to give the attention due to the resource 
the archaeological sites, the archaeological information that we need, but also, if you will, to compound that with an educational component. And more often than not, we try to reach out to young people because we feel, and it's been shown, that if we can get them interested into archaeology and what we're doing and what we like to do is sort of blend the, these two buzzwords together, if you will, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and then blend that with the humanities so that, quote, there can be something for everyone. Okay, this is what we've been doing here this past year. Back to that, go back to uh, OSA Raleigh. We've got over 50,000 archeological sites recorded in North Carolina. 1,309 were added in 2018. We've got 2,004 of those paper reports have been digitized. And over 40,000 archeological site forms have been entered into our database and 20,000 have been scanned. So what's an archeological site form? That's the cliff notes of the site. So once the site is located, an archeological site form is prepared, filled out, submitted to the office. It gets a number, a tracking number, if you will, but it allows us to place that site in time and in space. And then we have those forms which supplement these reports. Now, oftentimes, depending upon, we may not get a full-blown report for every site that we have recorded. So the archeological site forms become our cliff notes and they guide our research internally and research externally for students and sometimes uh, avocational archeologists. One gentleman, Jim Daniel, comes to mind who's already written one book on North Carolina archeology span and he's working on another. And then moving on down to a little bit of ER data, we looked at 987, we put 120 new reports in our library and 350,000, is that right? Th no, 35,000 acres were surveyed. So again, very dynamic. This year we've been very fortunate and I am very fortunate and privileged to be the state archeologist with the group that we have. But I felt it was important to, to list the names of the folks that we've either hired or promoted this year. And you can see down at the bottom, we have two new folks at uh, QAR. Uh, conservator, both are divers, one's a lab manager, staff archaeologist, assistant state archaeologist, uh, DOT technicians. Again, like I said, we have partnerships, so we're very happy. Uh, some of our new tools. So we acquired this year a GPS on the left, and we acquired the total station on the right. Prior to that, we used a recreational handheld GPS and we used maps and compasses and chains and everything else, but you can see Dr. Mary Beth Fitz on the right, who I think is in a state of happiness because it actually worked like it was supposed to work at the time we needed it to work. Going back south, southeast to Curry Beach, excuse me, we, along with many in North Carolina, suffered greatly from Hurricane Florence. The UAB was no exception. We had anywhere from four to six inches of water in the main building, we had water on the outside and you can see here. So what we have done is we have begun to rebuild that office. And that goes back to what I said earlier about the, the, the skills that, that we have in the Office of State Archaeology. We are doing this in-house. We are rebuilding from the floor up to about three feet, the walls, the insulation, hanging doors of what they've been needed. So we're doing this in-house. One thing, again, that we're very happy about is our certified local government program. And we work with the State Historic Preservation Office with that. We got Michelle Michael down here to my left, who has works with the town of Wake Forest, who have submitted several different grants in. And this is just a meeting, and I think that's David presenting to the COG program in Chapel Hill. And again, it's a different kind of education. And here we go. System agencies and universities, the top left, NCDOT, okay? So that's a DOT person. I think that's Paul Moeller on the right, David Cranford in the center, and Matt Jorgensen with an archeological consultant, uh, A.E. Khan on the left. And then you have staff with the Army Corps of Engineers at Falls Lake. And then I think that's Courtney working, vacuuming, cleaning, condition reporting, a dugout canoe at Terrell Lane Middle School. That canoe actually belongs to the state of North Carolina, but we are responsible for its care and feeding, if you will. But that school developed a display case that is climate control, that is safe, that is secure. So it's uh, gonna be in their lobby of the school. So again, it's another educational outreach portion of what we do. And we assist the public quite a bit. Site visits, 
artifact identification. Just yesterday, a young man was in with a box of rocks. Uh, we take many, many phone calls and emails. Can you tell me what this is? Can you come see what I've got? Is this important? Well, what should I do? One of the main ones that we deal with are cemeteries. So you can see here that uh, the Grand Avery Family Heritage Burial Ground, and then on the right, an abandoned cemetery visited by the Western Office. So we make site visits out there again to try and to share what we know with the public and help them, if you will, to better care for archeological sites that may be on their property or cemeteries that may be on their property. So in one respect, we're viewed as a subject matter experts for that. And everyone in the office gets to go out and sometimes it looks like it's a rainy day there and sometimes it's not so rainy day there. Uh, and then go back, we talked about the CLG. This is one of the projects right here. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Partnerships in Archaeology was our 2018 Archaeology Month poster worked off of this very successful um, certified local government project, right? At the Ailey Young House. And I just, it's not there because we just didn't have enough room to put it. But if you bear with me, I'll read you three paragraphs, which kind of sums up this project. The Ailey Young House is a rare example of reconstruction era housing. It was built around 1875 by Professor William Simmons as rental property for African American tenant farmers and workers. In 1899, Professor Simmons' widow, Mary Elizabeth, sold the house and property to Ali Young. Ali Young and her husband, Henry, raised their family in the house. Their oldest son, Alan, started the first private school for African-American children in Wake Forest. So by the due diligence on a survey and planning grant, sometime back, administered by the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, the house there was, was located. It was identified as to what it was. It definitely met the criteria. <laughs> you go back, I think we could do A, B, C, and D on that, on that particular house. That led to a series of workshops, bringing the descendant families and communities in together. Again, what we try to do is not talk at, but talk with our constituents. Go back to Lumber River State Park. We were out there for about five days. On the left slide, you can see uh, Chairman Godwin of uh, the Lumbee Tribal Chair and Dr. Stan Nick, and he was the Professor of Anthropology at UNC Pembroke for greater than 30 years. Myself and then Dr. Mary Beth Fitz meeting with uh, Commissioner Godwin, talking about the project, bringing them into it, let them know what we're doing. This was done in support of state parks because they want to build a much larger visitor center there. They want to increase their footprint. We knew based on our archeological site files that this site was important and we needed to do some archeology span there. So we enlisted state parks into this project. We interest, uh, brought in the Lumbee tribe into this. And at the bottom, Rosie Blewett is working with one of the younger archeologists in training there. Like I said, we take it very serious. We brought our uh, interns and volunteers out there to work. And as you can see up at the top right, it was a very successful project. Moving quickly, Halifax State, Halifax State Historic Site Excavation. Again, working on the far left with the purple cap is a PhD student from East Carolina University and, and Dr. Mary Beth Fitz with the GPS working there. So they're doing some mapping, they're doing some geophysics on the left, some actual excavation center and to the right. So again, we're all over the state, very dynamic. Most recently, metal detecting at Bentonville State Historic Sites. So already in these three slides, you've seen state parks and state historic sites. And we worked this with some uh, volunteers and with DOT. Another thing we did, we applied and were successful in uh, HBCU, MIHE, Historically Black College and Universities, Minority Institute of Higher Education a grant. And Mr. Malefi there was our student and he worked with our office on the American Indian Schools internship. So basically we did archival research, cartographic research and some field research to try to locate where some of these relic American Indian schools were located. Most of them are only known by their subsurface remains or some surface remains or by, by oral history. Uh, several, this one here on the right is still standing. That was a very successful project. Blackbeard 300 finished up this year. You can see an open house there. There's tanks, house, a cannon. Left-hand side, a little live fire demonstration. Top right, some artifacts there. 
folks coming in and then support ECU with their homecoming. We agreed to take a cannon out there and kind of do a show and tell with that as well. Some of our uh, more uh, outreach activities. La Fiesta in, in Winston-Salem. It's part of the Latino education and outreach program that we're a part of. Fort Dobbs State Historic Site. Asheville Art Museum intern, interns tour at the Western Office. And where we are at some conferences. The three archaeologists from Raleigh at the left-hand side were in a symposium. A river runs through it regarding Catawba archaeology. Native American Youth Organization Conference, Southeastern Conference on Historic Sites Archaeology, and an Artifact Conservation Workshop. As much as public education and outreach is important to us, professional development is equally as important because you cannot have one without the other. And just a little bit about our Archaeology Month 2018. Our speakers were diverse. And again, the captions at the bottom. And we have a student symposium, student research symposium. We allow students to come into the office, to this very building, this very auditorium, and present their research. It gives them a chance to interact with professionals, get more polished and professional in their uh, presentations. And our archaeology day, we have flint napping. We got uh, NC State represented on the bottom left. And how we get the word out, lectures, videos, YouTube, poster and rat cards, Facebook Live, YouTube channels, Instagram, and this was our 2018 Archaeology Month. I should go back. That was 2017, Haley Young. It was 2017 poster. My mistake. 2018, changing landscapes, dynamic environments, and what we're going to be doing in the future. It's pretty self-explanatory. We're working on quite a few different large projects, but these are some of them. You can always go to archaeology.ncdcr.gov to see what we're doing. And uh, I thank you for coming today. We'll try to take some questions if you have them. I appreciate everyone's attention. And uh, this is the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology and our contact information. Thank you. We have about eight. Hey, John, can you re, uh, state the question? Oh, I, I think the question was earlier I talked about our, the federally recognized tribes. We have about eight state recognized tribes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'll try to name them all off. We have the Kohari, the Lumbi, the Halawasa Pony, the Yokanichi, I'm drawing a blank now, um, the Meharan, the Waccamaw Suan. We have three or four. Uh, what would we call them? Um, Danny, help me out here. Metropolitan groups of tribes. So we interact with them like we would the federal tribes. We, if, if we are working, Lumber River is, is, a, is, a, is a prime example. If we are working in the area of their influence or the area of their, their, they're interested in, we contact with them. We work very closely with the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs. I attend their meetings every quarter. And so we brief them on what we're doing. And in fact, we have a few projects that are being driven by 106 that we have made the overtures for the commission and or the American Indian community to come and volunteer at and actually see firsthand what archaeology is, how it's done, why we do it, and what the outcome is. Any other questions? Well, I thank you again for coming today, and I thank you for your support. On behalf of the Office of State Archaeology, I'd like to thank John Mintz for giving us a, uh, uh, speaking with us today. I'd also like to thank you all for joining us, and I hope to see you next month in the coming months. Um, to, as we continue our lecture series, please be sure to check out our website, uh, archaeology.ncdcr.gov, each month for upcoming information on uh, new events. Thank you so much.